Welcome parents to Hamilton High School's parent presentation series. Um, we started these parent presentations about four years ago uh, because we saw there was a need to provide some support services to parents in our community and within our school. Um, these parent presentations provide a wide range of topics. We have expert speakers that talk about social media, communication, mental health issues, uh, all the areas that uh, teens are um, going through and to educate parents on what they can do, resources they can obtain, and um, just support services. We also have a student educational series uh, at the same time in the evening. So you can bring your child with you and they will go to a separate classroom and they will um, get education on the same topic. Uh, most teachers give extra credit, but your child will always get two volunteer hours for every session they attend. And at Hamilton, we also have support groups that the social workers run. Uh, we have support groups for anxiety, depression, and self-harm. We have groups for grief, substance abuse, anger management. And we also provide one-on-one -on -one support to uh, students as well as meet with parents if there's issues you might be struggling with and need some professional guidance, you can come and meet with us. And um, so at Hamilton, we provide a great deal of services. Please contact us if you need any additional um, support or uh, we can sit down and talk about ways that we can help you and your child be successful during these high school years. Thank you so much for um, coming to our presentations and these presentations as you can see are videotaped and will be available um, two weeks after every presentation along with the PowerPoint and any other materials um, we will have them on our website so thank you and have a great day All right, hello, I'm Terry. Hi, Terry. <laughs> and Nicole. And um, so we'll introduce ourselves a little bit. So um, I'm a licensed professional counselor. I still work over um, very per diem over at Aurora. I've been there five years. Um, I'm actually over at, uh, I'm a PhD student. I'm walking May 12th, yay. Um, <laughs> so uh, with a counselor education and supervision uh, program uh, over at Regent University, it's in Virginia Beach. So I'll be flying out there this next month. I'm also with the um, Arizona Counselors Association. It's ASCA.org. Uh, I'm the president for the Arizona um, Association of Counselor Education and Supervision and past president for the Algebra Tech. So looking at LGBT issues and um, uh, we do a lot. So if you have questions, you can also go on our website there. Um, and then I primarily work over at Dustin Bieber Health as a clinical director. It's um, five group homes and I go in as the counselor and then um, uh, primary counselor and then the clinical director and I just uh, work within, there's 30 clients in the group homes. Little I'm a licensed <laughs> professional counselor through the Arizona Board of Behavioral Health Examiners. Um, I moved from New Jersey two years ago and since then I've been working at Aurora Behavioral Health and I um, have been working with the adolescents and their families so um, I have a lot of experience so if you have questions after I've, I feel like I've experienced it all in two years, short enough time, <laughs> kids are so intense, you get it. Um, and I also have advanced trainings in EMDR, which is a trauma treatment, and I have advanced training in tri-basic models of trauma, advanced training in um, equine-assisted mental health, and in REBT, Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. So we worked at Aurora together in the adolescent um, 
outpatient and so primarily working uh, we did multifamily groups um, and the kids there are primarily dealing with suicide and self-harm so um, very passionate about that area and so that's going to be what we're talking about today um, we're going to actually start, so I heard the brain development you guys focus on in the beginning of the year. We actually are going to focus on that here too, just in the very beginning, and that's to give you sort of an understanding. A lot of times the stigma of mental health is that um, it's a choice. You know, one, one of the things parents deal with a lot when they come in is they, um, they're struggling with, is this a mental health issue or is this, um, you know, they're just being bad kids. So they struggle with between punishment versus let's get these kids help. So I want the, the focus that we wanted to show is that it's, it's a mental health issue, which is part of the brain, okay? And so um, we, we take it a stand of not punishment, um, but helping them through this process uh, of what they're going through. So it's very different. It's not a bad kid being bad when they cut. It's um, it's a kid that's sick and needs some help. Um, and then we also talk not about, so we talk about the resources at the end, and just, we're not gonna talk about suicide. I have one slide, we have one slide on suicide, and the reason is because in the research, it shows they're very different. Um, they're classified very differently. Uh, just because a kid is cutting doesn't mean they're suicidal. Just because they're suicidal doesn't mean they're cutting. But if I'm um, cutting, a lot of times, uh, there are some suicide ideation that occurs, so suicidal thoughts and there's always risk factor for it. So, but they're two separate things. <clears throat> all right, so first I wanna ask you all to um, just jot down what you think a definition of self-harm is. Put, a, put together a couple words and how you would define it. <laughs> All right, so what do we got? We have any volunteers to share what they wrote? All right, thank you. Um, hurting yourself to make sure you still feel something, have some control in your life over something. Okay, so can you repeat that? Oh, sure. I can I can just say it louder if you'd like. <laughs> oh, for that. Okay. Um, uh, hurting yourself to make sure you still feel something or have control in your life over something. Good. Who else? Okay. Just risk taking behaviors. Like in other words, I'm going to do this just because I want to see if I can do it. But it's it's risky and it, so what? You know, I don't care. Those okay. kind of attitudes. Okay, good. What else? I thought it was more specific engaging in actions that cause trauma to the body in some way, rather okay. than just putting yourself in harm's way. You're actively creating trauma. All right, good. One more? Feeling pain, because a lot of them say they can't feel anything, so by cutting themselves, they feel something that makes them feel good. Okay, good. So, these are all great definitions, and we'll go into more, and you'll kind of see that we touch on all of these in the theories and the definition. So, you can go ahead and move on. Okay, so, self-harm is not new. I'm gonna have to read this. Um, we have a quote from the Bible that reads, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So this isn't to look at this from a religious standpoint, but it's to look at the documentation of self-harm dating back this long ago. So it's not a new phenomena. This is something that people have been engaging in for thousands of years, at least. A few thousand years. So it's historical. So that was the primary factor is just to look at it from, you know, again, not a biblical perspective, but the Bible is a historical book and to see that self-harm is not new, right? So it's not this new thing that's occurring in this era, right? Which a lot of times we, we tend to kind of think so. Um, so it's not new. Okay. And here we have a lot of uh, words that we use to describe 
self-harm. So we have self-harm, self-injury, non-suicidal, self-injury, cutting, and these are somewhat interchangeable. I prefer to use non-suicidal self-injury, um, and as we get into this, you'll see that it's different from suicide a little bit. Uh, Terry spoke on that a little bit. Um, and for me, that helps define what it is um, instead of just cutting, you know, it's, that's the action. But um, there are also many ways to self-harm that isn't cutting. So it kind of narrows it if you're looking at it like that. But these are the common terms. Um, and we have a study by Nock and Christine that we're looking at um, self-mutilative behavior and their definition they have is that it refers to the direct and deliberate destruction of one's own body tissue without suicidal intent. And this can include um, kicking, biting, punching, burning, scratching. So there's, there's a wide array and uh, there's more than that and there's, I feel like there's gonna be more to learn as we go on. And Terry's gonna speak on the contagion effect. She has a great example. Okay, so, um, the, so when we think of self-harm, so a lot of times we think of, so it, for instance, my, my mother-in-law is a school administrator. She was, I was talking to her about the contagion effect. And she told me about a story where a teacher was noticing cutting in the classroom, a couple girls doing it, so she created a group, you know, well-intentioned. The, the fact is, is that there's a contagion effect. When I put somebody um, in a group that's self-harming and I put them all together, what actually happens is it begins to grow, so it begins to spread. And so with self-harm, um, and that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of law based on what we can report on the news as far as suicide. So, and that's the same area as people see suicide clusters occurring. Okay, so if you, uh, the research shows, so uh, there's strict laws and prohibitions against news people um, talking about suicide. And so in schools or any, even in a mental health facility like Aurora, we don't talk about um, self-harm directly. If a kid is self-harming, we um, don't allow them to talk about it directly in group. And the reason is because it, it does create the sense of, and we'll talk more about it, it feel, so we're talking about a coping skill, right? As we get into this, self-harm is just this unusual thing that a lot of us look at. I think it's quite fascinating. I know that's a weird word to put on it, but as a, as a soon-to-be researcher, and um, it, you know, it is a fascinating thing that somebody, but what it is, is a, it's a coping skill, okay? They, they're hurting, they're depressed, and they cut, and, they, and it makes them feel better. And so we're dealing with something that works for them, and so that's why it's so hard to pull away. Just like if we're dealing with food addiction, or drinking, or you know, adults, we, we deal with these things too, right? So, um, so the contagion effect is it's not good to talk about it within a group. It's better direct or in individual counseling. Mm -hmm. so, could I just? Say, yeah. I sent my kid to the group. Are they not? What are they doing? Just from my own peace of mind now. <laughs> yeah. In this group here? Yeah. Well, we're not. In this So just like with the uh, primary suicide self-harm that comes into Aurora or any type of psychiatric facility, we still have um, very specific things that are not, everyone knows that there's cutting involved, but it's not, it's very, um, it's indirect how we focus and on right. it. Yeah. I just want to add, it's more education and healthy coping skills. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. And that's what we want to teach them. Yes. Yeah, and that's exactly what we would want to see, yeah. right? We don't want a, a support group, a peer-led support group, where they're just going into the details. So I think that's what it really is about, not going into the details of it. Like, one of my group rules is, like, if you self-harm or you're having thoughts of wanting to end your life, you can say that. Anything beyond that, you need to talk to me after group because it can trigger other people. Or if someone just self-harmed and they're talking, like romanticizing it, um, other people might be like, yeah, I'm feeling bad. I know that's gonna help. 
mm -hmm. right? So we want to reduce that. And so like uh, she was saying, coping skills and learning about it, what's going on. A lot of times these kids don't know what's going on with them as much as you don't know what's going on with them. Um, so it's hard for them to articulate. So it's helpful to get that education and then also get other coping skills, other options instead of like Terry was saying, self-harm is a coping skill, a negative coping skill, but it's a coping skill. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're gonna do an uh, activity, kind of. So this is a research study and so I'm gonna, actually, I just want you to, this is what they did in the study. Okay, so I just want you to look straight ahead at Nicole. <laughs> and for 45 seconds, you're just not going to look at the light. Okay. And I'll time it. And I'll just move the light. And you'll just look at Nicole. <laughs> fascinating study by Luna. The, um, what they did is they looked at the brain of an adolescent and a brain of an adult. They gave them that, that exercise. They said, look straight ahead. They were both in separate groups. And they shined a light, probably much bigger. I don't know the size of it. And they said, look straight ahead. Don't look at the light. And what they discovered is that they both could do it. Right? Both groups were fine. The kids could do it. The adults could do it. And they were teens. Um, however, what happened in the brain was very fascinating to researchers. And what they discovered is that what happens in the adolescent brain to not look at the light took a lot more effort than the adult. So the adult was able to, you know, whatever, look at, you know. The adolescent really had to pinpoint, okay, don't look at the light, don't look at the light, don't look at the light. There was a lot of frontal lobe action going on. So when I say looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, must be a duck, so it's not so with the adolescent, right? Things like an adult acts like, no, it must be, no, adolescent, still adolescent. So a lot of parents and people, right, we want to talk to adolescents like they're adults, or we want to treat them like they're adults. And the fact is they're not adult, and they can't think like an adult. It doesn't matter how tall or wide they are, or how much, you know, how responsible they, they are day to day enough. They are not an adult in the brain up until they're about 25. So their development is, so when we consider self-harm and what's going on with these kids, right, and depending on the culture and the world and the globe, part of the globe that we live in, uh, definition of adolescence and adulthood is very different. Other countries define adulthood as 15 years old, 25 years old. We choose 18 as the United States. That's just, you know. But really, research is starting to come out where the, the adolescent brain is really, I mean, there's this period from 18 to 30, it's called the emerging adult stage, where there's, there's this period of time where kids are moving out, they move back in, really having a hard time becoming adult, right? If you notice that if you have older kids, or I think about my own life of moving back home, and you know, they call it the boomerang effect, right? And so until um, about 30 years old where you're sort of finding your place in the world. So that's sort of where we want you to see is like the brain is very different. Do you Here. Do you think we do? Okay. So this was a this was a study done um, that it was a it was a uh, they used this study quite frequently to show yeah in a minute though okay. the um, how the brain develops so they did this longitudinal study of uh, ages five to twenty and what they did is they looked at the brain every two years to see how it developed and what they discovered is that the brain develops from the rear of the brain to so the brain stem to so the mid brain to so the frontal lobe and so. You know, the impulsivity of kids, right? Um, the impulsivity, it's clear based on, and there's lots of other studies too, but this is one that's looked at quite often. And so this is like a, literally a two second clip of it. Oh, good. Of, I mean, it's two seconds. But you can see how it matures. Right, so that's actually from the study. See if I can get back. Okay. Um, and of course, I think this is pretty common knowledge. That, you know, girls mature fast or faster than boys, and uh, the frontal regions are slower at developing. 
So revisiting this, uh, the Luna experiment with impulsivity, I'm gonna show another video. So when we think again of this impulsive, you know, as we get more into the self-harm, I just want you to remember that as we talk about this mental health issue, right, um, of self-harm, that it's something, you know, depression, something's going on in the brain that's affecting it as well, right? That, so this is a video on impulsivity. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one. So then you'll have to. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. So it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> they showed, they did long-term studies on that, that and showed that those kids that ate the two, the marshmallow right away actually had, were more likely to have uh, addiction issues later on in life, so into adulthood. So looking at um, even, and there was a lot of other stuff, but that was one of the primary things they were looking at is how impulsivity early on could, could there's no cause and effect, right? Nothing could cause that, but what happens is, you know, even that early, they can start to see some risk. So, um, another thing that they, uh, well, the study by Powell that I cited down there. Um, so for kids, again, looking at the brain, a small reward, a big reward, let's say clean your room, you get $200, that's a big re reward. What happens in the brain is it fires up, right? It, 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 there's a lot of action going on, that's a big reward. Small reward, so you get $2 to clean your room. Very small, right? Nothing happens. <laughs> Nothing, okay, happens in that brain. So what this, uh, you know, le uh, suggestive of some of the stuff with, with self-harm, this is a large reward system, right? We're talking about, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I'm angry, and all of a sudden I do this and I feel a lot better. Really quick, right now, 
right? And so, and so that is a large reward. So as parents, as counselors, as teachers, as we come and say, oh, hey, stop doing that. Um, here, write in a journal instead. It's gonna take time. Writing in a journal long-term is gonna be great, right? We know that. Going to counseling long-term is going to be great. But the short, it's not, the effect of it is not as quick as self-harm, right? And so we're taking away something and trading it with something that's, to them and their, even in their brain, is not equal at, at any level, right? It's not equal. Yeah. yeah. What does make it, what, what makes them feel better in a medical sense? Or is it just the fact that now that focus is on something else because that's got to hurt? Or? Um, you mean when they self-harm? Yeah. What is it doing? So um, similarly to how uh, you know you get injured, your your body goes into shock. All those chemicals are released. So the two main reasons that I've, from my clients, my personal experience, of why they self-harm is because if they're numb, it makes them feel something, or if they're feeling so many overwhelming feelings that they don't know how to manage, it stops that. So it. The pain, and a lot of times non-suicidal self-injury, right, it's superficial. So it, um, Maybe explain it's what that is, superficial. A super, a very low cut. Um, just not through the first layer of, so yeah, first layer of skin. Yeah. Not needing stitches, not needing anything like that. A lot of times it's that way. Some people self-harm more severely, but it's more common that it's superficial. And so what's going on in the body, like she's talking about the, the pleasure center, the reward center, you get that immediately. So for a lot of these adolescents, they do not have the capacity to continue to wait. And sometimes it's the feelings are too strong or the duration is way too long and they can't deal with it anymore. So it's giving you that. You have a question? So is there medication that will help the kids or more counseling that will help the kids? So or I think is that like depending on the person? Both, and we'll talk, I don't think we have actually medication in the slide, but we'll talk, oh, to, and, okay, so she's asking about the medication, so because they're filming it, so I'll repeat the question. Um, She's asking, is there medication, is medication or counseling effective? So the research showed that together they're the best, the, be, the, um, um, the best treatment is together. Medication helps them to get up quickly, right, out of that depression where therapy is effective. Therapy is not effect, as effective if I'm super depressed and I can't, I can't be cognitive with you, right? I can't talk to you, I can't express to you. So medication helps them lift up, and therapy then helps them to give them tools. So either one, uh, research shows either one is effective, but together they're the most effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're usually the most recommended, that's usually recommended. So that's why adolescents are really vulnerable to these things. So again, just, and we're gonna sort of slide into um, the, the self-harm and theories behind it, but again, just looking at the brain of depression and panic. So again, showing you in the non-depressed brain, what you're seeing is there's more activity occurring. So you see more activity in the frontal lobe. This is an adult brain, it's not an adolescent brain, so I'm sorry on that level, but it just to show you, it's a great picture of just to show you the, the differences of what's occurring. And then in the panic, right, you got a lot of action, a lot, happening in the brain. Um, okay, so as we both go into self-harm, this is a study, and I know it looks confusing, so I'm gonna explain it. Nicole's like, I do not wanna talk about this <laughs> slide. But, um, so, okay, so this is a really interesting study. What it looked at was depression and self-harm. The researchers, I know it's sort of dated 1997, however, the, 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 I put more recent research um, sort of connecting the dots. We put 99.9 .9 with a smiley face because poor communication with kids and parents is pretty high. Um, and so what this is study or looking at is the link, what they were, what they were questioning is how, is how does self-harm, if we take kids that are self-harming, what is their parent communication like, okay? So their communication, um, is it poor with parents or is it good? How are they rating this? And so what they discovered is that it, there was a significant effect 
and poor communication. So kids who had poor communication with their parents who reported this, right, um, were more often self-harming. The researchers put in uh, the variable of depression and it skyrocketed. I mean, it was like, it was, the, so what they actually ended up doing is taking out the variable of depression and only and wanting to see, do we still have a significance between the effect of these two variables? And there was. And so there's more research to support. And this, this, uh, the arrows is what I'm showing you is that there's not a, there's not a causation. Okay, just because I tell harm doesn't mean it causes a doesn't cause B. What this means is that sometimes depression and self, um, it comes before self-harm and then com poor communication. Sometimes it's depression and self-harm and poor communication. And there's meaning, just because I have bad communication with my parents, which is like most of us, right? Most kids, doesn't mean I'm gonna self-harm or have suicidal thoughts, right? So that's not a link creating causation, right? All right, um, so now we're gonna look at the theories of why, wait, put it back. Oh, sorry. I wanna ask the audience. Why, what are some of the reasons you think that teens self-harm? Think about it for a minute. And, okay, yes? Self-esteem issues, obviously. Self-esteem issues? What they see in the mirror isn't what they hope they wish to see. Okay, so what they see in the mirror is not what they hope to see. Okay, good. What else? Someone else is cutting, so they're cutting. Okay, good. Is it ever for attention or attention? For attention, okay, we're gonna touch on that. And I'm happy you said that because that's something that um, in a group of people this size, there's at least, there's, there, I would say probably a quarter of people that would say that they've either said that or heard it from someone else saying they just want attention. All right, yes? If a child feels worthless. If a child feels worthless, great, great. And that ties in with depression. And they have self-blame. Self-blame, yes, great. Relief, Relief. good. Good. All right, so our next slide, we're gonna be looking at the, well, for the four theories, um, but the attention-seeking theory is not really an accepted one in the field. Um, we There's not much research around it, but the research that we do have, uh, well, I'll get to that. But okay, so we have addiction theory, attention-seeking theory, communication theory, and affect regulation theory. So we're gonna talk about addiction theory first and we have a great clip well, we don't have the sound. that we don't have sound for. So we will skip that because you kind of need the sound for that. But um, it's gonna be on the web, the, what is the website? The social work? The Hamilton High School Social Work page. Hamilton High School Social Work page. You're gonna have access to all these slides. Um, so you can look at it later, but the, um, would you like to talk a little bit about the video and the addiction? So it just sh it's gonna show what addiction is, again, looking at it from a brain standpoint. It uses alcohol and drugs as words in it, um, but we say, you know, look, uh, try to replace that word with self-harm, um, mm -hmm. and, and the two can run hand in hand, what the research is. So it can work just like an addiction in the brain. And so based on the disease model of addiction, which is primarily, um, I would say 99.9% .9 time is what's looked at in, or used in any type of um, healthcare setting or medical setting or behavioral health setting is the disease model of addiction that it resides in the brain. There's lots of research to show that. And that's the reason why we have um, our insurance companies pay for it, right? Is because there's research that shows it's a brain disease it was just a choice, like it was, you know, they thought it was 75 years ago, um, there would be no insurance would not cover that, mm -hmm. a choice factor. So the disease model is um, is uh, within the healthcare, like our insurance companies, too. 
Right, and similarly, I mean, I think it's a lot more common to know about um, alcoholism and a drug addiction. So, you know, take your knowledge from that and how like it's an impulsive thing and, you know, the reward center is lit up and the reasons for um, using is common, it's similar. It's similar to with self-harm. Which one? Okay, no. I got it. <laughs> All right, so there was a study by Harvey and Brown in 2012, and they were exploring the language of self-harm. And what they did is they went on this pre-existing blog, and it's in the UK, the researchers are in the UK, and the blog is teenagehealthfreak.org. And what this uh, blog is is for teens that are seeking help that Maybe they don't have anyone to talk to or they don't feel comfortable talking about it. A lot of times the teens these days, like they're more comfortable with online resources or you know, typing things rather than verbalizing. It's part of their culture now. So they went in with permission into this blog and they studied the blog posts. And they found a few things. Um, the first, well, the first thing is that 20% uh, of teens self-harm, and that's similar to the United States. The United States is estimated at 23%, so we can generalize this study to the United States. I mean, there's a lot of similarities with the UK um, in addition, and we're cl it's close, 20 and 23%, it's pretty close. So we found, th we, they, the researchers, <laughs> found that uh, there's a habitual nat nature of self-harm which is indicative of the addiction theory, right? The habitual nature. It becomes a habit. It becomes something that you do, right? Um, and a lot of, they found that within here, a lot of the people were saying that it's the only effective means for emotional relief. So these teens are saying this. On this blog, it's, protect, it's safe, and there's also um, therapists that are on there giving feedback and hooking them up with uh, services. Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to say that the 1.6 million words. So what they this is a qualitative research study. So qualitative, looking at um, the the posts themselves, like she said. So the, they looked at 106 million words within the post to find themes. They pulled out themes, and what they were specifically looking at um, was addiction theory. And so these were the, these are actual posts from the kids. So they're misspelled, right? I I made it just like how they spelled it. Um, from the kids, and so we're gonna show another one too. And again, posts from the kids of, in red, sort of how they pulled out these themes of, of what these kids were saying. You can actually go on, this, this website is fascinating, the teenagehealth.org, freak.org, you can go on there now, and it's great. I mean, they talk about everything you don't want, you know, bodily movements, um, poop, <laughs> like, you know, think, yeah. Teenage what? Teenagehealthfreak.org. Um, and, and, and it's great because they can, it is in the UK, but it's right here. Teenagehealthfreak.org. And it's great. I mean, all the things they don't want to talk to mom about or talk to people about, um, they can go on there and look at it. Um, and one of the things is self-harm. And it's all ran by doctors, um, healthcare professionals. So it's... It's not ran by kids, uh, so they they actually post back to um, healthcare professionals. Post back to the kids. Post. All right, and in red we just highlighted some of the the things like she said that they pulled from. So we have for me it's an addiction, it's a bad habit. I needed to do it, reflecting addiction theory. All of these, and I have addiction to it. That one's probably the most clear. I have an addiction to it. And it also appears, on the so a side note, that these kids have a pretty good self-awareness of why they're doing it and what's going on. Mm -hmm. So as we move on to the next slide, the attention-seeking theory. So can I have a show of hands of people that have thought this or heard someone else say it? 
And I mean, we were at one point before all our training thought it too, right? Yeah, <laughs> and because that's that's kind of part of the stigma, yeah. yes. right? That's part of the stigma. These kids are being brats or they just want attention, um, especially because it's superficial, right? So if you really wanted to self-harm, wouldn't you do it deep? Like that's not serious, that's just a light cut. It's a little scab. Or sometimes they don't even um, draw blood. So it would be easy to draw from that, like, oh, that's not serious. They're just looking for attention. But that's not true, because as we know, that it doesn't take a deep cut to get that emotional relief. Make sense? And, okay, so there's a study that showed that, uh, so this is one of the research studies in the addiction, uh, attention-seeking theory, and they found that interpersonal reasons to self-harm is less likely. So instead of, you know, a kid be, being able to just talk to you, um, they're not able to, right? For whatever reason, they're not able to, and it's not just to frighten someone, right? So in the study, they found that it's not just for you to freak out, or it's not just to be like, wow, we really need to do something, or, you know, just wanting to go on that trip that you said no to, right? It's not for that. And again, just our, our thoughts on it. We both agree that, we disagree that the, uh, with um, any of We agree of the, together. <laughs> we agree that, whatever. We do not like the attention-seeking theory. And, it's um, part of the stigma, so that's working through the, the it's normal, right? If we've all felt it, we've all, or we've all thought it. Um, at one point, um, but it's part of the stigma. But it's mm -hmm. again that, what do I do? They're cutting and it's bad and how do I fix this? I know I'm t told not to punish them, but I'm really angry and they're hurting themselves. And so we're gonna have a slight on that. What do I do? And so that's, um, and, and so the that. affect regulation theory, so the, um, and, and again with the attention, so even if I'm, so this is what I sort of wanna hit home with, even if, the kid is attention seeking, it's not normal attention seeking, okay? It's abnormal attention seeking. Um, I think it's like, gosh, I wanna say under 10, 9% of the population, well, we showed aside about 12% in those studies of teens self-harming, but even smaller than that, that it's suicidal, right? And so, and so what I wanna, even if it's attention seeking, right? Suicide and self-harm is not normal behavior, right? So regardless, they need help. Um, okay, so this, 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 there's two studies here. Um, and what, what they looked at again is to look at why they surveyed teens. Um, and to see, oh, what, what, why are they, and they, this was not a qualitative, this was, these were questions on a survey, and the kids were able to answer, you know, one through five, five being the most, you know. And so what they discovered from two different studies, anger and hostility were like the top things, top emotions that were difficult for these teens, right? They were more likely to self-harm when they were angry or hostile. So that was like a really high emotional feeling inside that most, they weren't able to handle didn't think they were able to handle. So to reduce the emotional pain, to get out my frustration, um, to reduce the tension, uh, so really just looking for this quick relief of, of what's going on within internally. <clears throat> the communication theory is my favorite um, theory, and I, yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. We, all, we all know that self-harm is bad. I mean, we. Um, but these people who are self harming <coughs> they're feeling relief. When I cut myself, I don't feel relief. Uh -huh. I'm like, how could, it, it's a difficult brain chemistry is what is happening, correct me if I'm wrong? Is it? Same pleasure sense that, you know, just, they just discovered that that works for them. So the same thing is occurring. So even like in somebody who's addicted to alcohol, or if I um, do something positive, like um, I don't know, nothing can create that amount of dopamine in my brain as 
cutting or drinking or smoking, these, these quick fixes, right? So um, it's sort of the same, but what's happening in the brain is not is the same, right? This, this overload of pleasure sense is happening. And teens are especially vulnerable and kids because of that, um, the brain development is not full, right? So their impulsivity is high. And so they're more likely to feel that quick, like that reward center of that um, big reward gives me a lot of pleasure. The small reward gives me little pleasure, right? Um, and the kid brain, or in the teen brain, right? And so, um, again, when we think about like adults and then kids, their, their experience in it is different. They just want something quick, um, usually, right? Uh, this, the communication theory is, I, I like it the best. Um, that's just my personal, usually when I'm working with kids or even adults, I work with adults now, um, primarily now, but even when adults self-harm, um, I do look at this theory a little bit more, and that's because there's oftentimes a language that's spoken with self-harm. So when I say that, it's um, the communication factor is big. So a lot of times I will say, what is it that, if that cutting could speak, what would it say? I, I'm hurting, right? They'll tell me, I'm hurting, I'm sad, right? So this, this difficulty with communicating, the communication factor is just not intact, it appears with me. It's like, it's not um, their inability to vocalize what's going on with them is not um, developed to a point where I'm sad, I, I cut myself, Mom, I'm sad, you see this cut, Dad, you see this cut, um, and to the parent, that they don't understand cutting, right? They don't understand that language of cutting, so the reaction is not the, what they're wanting, right? And that's normal. I mean, who's gonna react? I mean, parents don't react well to cutting, right? I mean, it's just, it, it's scary, it's frightening, it's saddening, Parents don't know what to do, right? They want to hold their kid tight and not let them go, right? And so um, when we look at, so that first part looks at internal locus of control. An internal locus of control says that I'm in control of who I am, and external locus of control says the world is in control of who I am. And so what's interesting is that you would think it would be the opposite with teens that self-harm, but based on the research that I looked at, um, it's more of an internal locus of control. So it's almost as though what it suggests is that the teens are saying, I need to fix me, and I can't, right? This internal locus of control, they are in control of their emotions and they have to fix me, and they're trying to, right? And so um, when teens believe, again, looking at this study, it's, it's fascinating as, as certainly we're not blaming parents, right? But just to, I want, with this research to show you that it's a, like, you are a part of the healing process, right? As parents um, in all different areas. And so we have a slide on how important you are in the healing process, how important teachers are, how important counselors are in the healing process, right? So it's not to say that, um, it's also to say how important you are, right? As parents, as we are, as we're parents, um, that we're important. We're not supposed to just let our kids go to therapy and just drop them off and then not want to be a part of it, right? A lot of counseling will in, in require, Aurora requires that parents be involved, right? And so, and just like I work in other places, parents must be involved. And that's because we need that factor of how important the change of communication within the family is. Um, so the part where, pardon, friend to friend, oh, what they looked at was friend to friend relationship versus parent relationship. What they discovered is that parent to, parent to child relationship was much more effective. And what they, they the researchers didn't know why that was, right? They, but they made hypotheses of why that could be. And they said that it's possible that parents or adults are able to sort of um, catapult their child into a better way of thinking and coping versus friend who's my age, right? And so they hypothesized that might be why, but they weren't sure. Observations on cutting, so when the cutting changes, so depending on a lot of teens or adults will um, cut, and mostly it's teen population that's doing it, it um, just cutting in general. But they may start on their legs and their thighs, 
okay, they might, which is a place where you're really not going to see. Um, and so, the, and they're wearing clothes where you're not seeing, you're not noticing, right? And then all of a sudden it changes. It goes from the legs to the arms. And then all of a sudden they're, wearing, they're wanting to show you that they're cutting. And then they're wanting to, you know, it's interesting to see it in inpatient when at, at the hospital where you see it, some kids are, you know, draping their shirt, which you're not allowed, so we have to ask them to change it. Or, um, you know, they're totally hiding themselves in, in, in dark garments and, and long sleeves and hoodies. And, and, and so what is this that sometimes they're really open with it and it changes direction? And so it's part of that communication, okay? So all of a sudden, and they'll tell me this too, it's like, I'll say, that's interesting. So you used to cut on your legs, now you're cutting on your arms, why did you change? And, and they'll tell me various things, but a lot of times it's, well, I'm ready to talk about it. That's what it, I mean, they don't say, tell me those words, but um, it comes out like, yeah, I'm ready to talk about it. But, um, you know, in so many words, it's like all of a sudden they're ready. They're ready to have people see. They're ready to have, and it's not attention seeking. It's still, I'm trying to communicate and I'm ready to talk about it. So it's very um, revealing where they're cutting. I've seen adults that start on their legs, legs completely, I don't know how else to say it, but slashed. All, all scars and arms all over and and sometimes you'll see them wearing different clothes um, some days and some days not some day they'll they'll pick who they're willing to talk to about so it changes depending on who you are how comfortable they feel or when they're ready to talk and um, I'd like to speak a little bit on that too with communication theory um, I have had many teens come in and parents that either are very aware that their communication is not great and I've had many teens and parents come in and the parents say we have great communication we talk about everything we always have and then the parents leave and the kids are like no we don't so <laughs> so um, yeah and, and it seems that they do, they had had and do have good communication in other areas. But now when it comes to this, there, kids don't know how to talk about it just as much as you don't know how to talk about it and you don't know what to do. And a lot of the teens have said to me too that they're really scared that they're gonna hurt their parent. And they have so much guilt and shame about doing it because, I mean, most of the time parents cry, right? Or get really upset, you know, and they see that. They don't want that for you. They don't want you to feel the way that they're feeling. They don't want that. They're just being open and honest. And another funny thing that I've found is that I, when I'm doing a session with uh, the parent and the child, I will verbatim either say what the parent has said or what the child has said, and the parent or the child will hear it for the first time. And I'm literally saying, and I'll say that, I'll be like, you know, that's exactly what she said five minutes ago. And I don't know why, but between parents and adolescents, sometimes you just need a third party to be able to say something or maybe help you say it in a different way. But I'd say a lot of the time I verbatim repeat. And there's just something different about a third party saying it. I don't have the emotion involved. I'm just stating it as a fact of what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. So I, I do adhere to this theory quite a bit and also affect regulation because, I mean, teens are up and down as it is. Now you wanna throw in depression or high anxiety, they don't know how to deal with that. They don't know what to do. And that's what we try and teach them, right? Like we were talking about the wonderful group that you have here in the school teaching coping skills. And I said to someone else when I was handing out the coping skills, one of the sheets you have is five grounding skills. And I said, you know, I feel like this should be taught in fifth grade or sixth grade to, to everyone. You know, I didn't get these, you know? I learned a lot of coping skills from being in school and, and I continue to learn new ones. Right? Graduate school. Not grade, not grade school. In grade school. Yeah. No, and I, I continue to learn them. And it's really helpful. She spoke about a little bit of it being like, a, it's a family issue, right? It's not just the kids. The whole system needs to change, right? And with these coping skills, I always encourage parents to practice these skills with their kids and the kids to 
past their parents and also gives you um, someone to be, what am I looking for? Not responsible to. Accountable. <laughs> it has you both be accountable to someone. And a lot of times the kids will talk about like, yeah, my parent wasn't, my parents weren't raised that way. My parents don't know this. They don't know how to do this. You know, and they give their parents a lot of credit. Like, they're doing better than their, their parents did with them. They're doing a really good job. They just don't know. They weren't taught this. And you can't pass it on to your kids if you don't know, right? If you don't know these simple coping skills, um, you don't know what to tell them. Like a lot of times it's like, calm down. Well, how much does that help? Has, has, has anyone ever been upset and someone told you to calm down? <laughs> what happens? <laughs> Whoop, <laughs> right? All right. I have a question. Yeah. So when, uh, speaking of communication, so when you're talking to a kid who's going through this or just verbalizing that he has or she has the and um, when you're trying to communicate with the child, as a parent, the natural reaction is like, oh my gosh, what's, what are you going through? And then the natural emotions are like, right. oh, like you said, mm -hmm. you're frightened, you're scared, just you want to cry. Repeat the question. Do you think that this has a negative impact on the child? Like guilt, you just said, so is it a good thing for a parent to be doing it? Or have, be in control of the emotions? Like how should a parent sure. react to that? So she's asking, how should a parent react to depression, self-harm, any of that? Like, should you ask, how are you doing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a bookmark there, because I'm actually going to teach you skills of what to do when this happens, and it will be perfect, because you, you don't want to ask that. How are you doing? And the reason is part of the, we go back to the brain, what's going on in the brain. And so I'll answer that. I'm going to give you, we're actually going to do some skill base, too. Um, thank you for asking that. <laughs> yeah. So measuring communication between parent and child. I'm going to move forward just because we're running out of time. And so the, um, these are just some things that they looked at, again, in the research. So communication, measuring communication between uh, child and parent, some of the things they asked. Uh, the teen suicide, this is the only slide that we put up with suicide, and that's because of what I said in the beginning is that the, they're separate things, right? So we don't want you to think that they're the same. However, they're both uh, risk factors of each other, right? So you can't ignore one, um, but they're two separate things. Uh, Self-harm is not a suicide attempt, right? It's not. Uh, depending on the, the, the depth of the cut, uh, again, it's called, in the medical or behavioral health, it's called superficial cutting. It's called, um, or, uh, you know, severe cutting, uh, the two different ones, right? Superficial cutting is, is likely not gonna get inpatient here. Um, uh, more severe cut is, because uh, it, it uh, is more of a suicidal gesture that's occurring. So that we look at that, like when we come in, when they come in patient, we look at if they're cutting, um, the likelihood of that being a suicide attempt or suicide gesturing. Um, so self-harm increases the risk for suicide. So there's this, uh, if we were looking at self-harm, there's a large percentage of them with, that have also suicide ideation. If I come over here to the suicide pool population, um, there's a small percentage that are self-harming. Okay, so large percentage of so self-harm is likely some suicide. Suicide doesn't mean there's a lot of self-harm. Okay, so two different pools. Uh, therefore, all self-harm should be taken seriously, um, regardless of how deep or, remember, it's not a normal behavior. It's not a, it's an abnormal coping skill. So this is when we get into the tools for change, and you have this first slide, right? Or do I do yeah, it? yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, so. We'll go kind of quickly. A lot of times we'll see outward behavioral issues with depression, right? Skipping school, not doing things in class, being disrespectful um, with you or with others, punching things, yelling, things like that, stop, stop doing things, stopping doing things that they once enjoyed doing. So this can also be like dropping out of basketball, right? Or um, stopping going to choir practice. <laughs> not enjoying going to church anymore, right? And it looks like they're defiant. 
I'm not going. I don't want to go. Right? And so what we want to impress upon you as having you being an active part of their recovery is that you be part of their therapy. You be open that there's changes that you need to make too. Okay? Um, and I always say, not in my box. <laughs> I always say that you keep your house rules and, and boundaries. You keep those, right? I'm just saying things that you can add. And it is case by case. Sometimes I'm like, all right, relax. If they don't do the dishes today, like, let that go. Sometimes they don't have the motivation due to the depression. So, but some kids, they're not doing the dishes because they want to, they, they just want to make a point. Right, so sometimes I'm like, no, you stay on that. But most of the time, most of the things, like be flexible, you know your kid, you can be a little flexible with like if they do the dishes or not, right? Okay, I'll just do the dishes today, right? Not too big of a deal. Um, but, but still stay stern with like the house rules. You know, we're not letting these kids take over the house. And sometimes that's hard for parents to see like um, the black, white, and gray. Right? Like the kids are not going to be taking over the house. That's not okay. That's not helpful for them. They need structure. We all need structure, whether we know it or not. And as adults, you just get structure, right? Having your, you wake up, you take care of your kids, go to work or whatever it is that you do. You have structure built in. And that's how we function, having the structure. And same with the adolescents. They need the structure. All right. All right. So. I want you, this is the activity. Okay, so this oh, is where I'm gonna lead into what your question was too. Okay, so this is an activity. I want you just to think about, I want you to close your eyes, if you were willing, so I can, I can read the activity and you can picture it in your mind. You made a reservation for 10 people for a birthday dinner at a five-star restaurant. Because this reservation is on a Friday night at 7 p.m., it was made two months ago. When you arrive and check in, the hostess tells you, I'm sorry, we don't have a party of 10 down under that name. The wait is going to be two hours. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead and open your eyes. Well, if you, if you have a piece of paper, just think about or write down the emotion that you feel. Has that ever happened to anyone? It's happened to me. So I did, I, um, I want you to, find out, I want you to discover where, what were some emotions that, you, that came up for you? Anger. Frustration, anger. Where did you feel it in your body? Here. Chest. Chest, stomach, chest is where we feel this. Okay, yeah. So I did this small, a small, uh, you know, small example. I didn't want to do something that was mental health related because I want to, what I want you to see is how your body reacts. How your body reacted to that scenario. So I'm gonna teach about the, just real quickly on the nervous system and then give some tools too. So what occurred in the nervous system at a very small rate was the sympathetic nervous system lit up, okay? So part of the brain is this, uh, the amygdala. So this, um, right in the middle, you can sort of see it, that little pin drop, it's called the almond-shaped part of our brain, uh, right in the middle, and it's where our emotions are housed. Okay, so when I did that scenario, you probably got a little sting, I would imagine, because that would make anybody mad. Even if you've never been through it, you, you just can picture that. The amygdala fired, okay? And what occurred in the body is you got this little, probably just maybe a, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, a three or a four, which is what I was going for, uh, three or a four of just sort of like uncomfortable, frustrated anger. And then, so that was part of that system. So that system says, High alert, high alert, right? In, in situations even like that, small, but in high situations, let's say I'm a teen that's really depressed and upset. My boyfriend just broke up with me. This is a high alert situation where the sympathetic nervous system fires because this situation, this event is occurring in my life. And now I'm all of a sudden fired up. What occurs in the body when the system fires up, the brain, the brain kicks on, you know, um, very quickly, right? We don't have to time it. Um, and the, uh, 
hormones are secreted in the brain. So epinephrine and other hormones, but that's the primary one, secreted from the brain, and it basically floods the nervous system. So the nervous system turns on, kicks on, I'm in a fight, fight. My body starts to actually shut down in areas. So my digestive system shuts down. My, um, my I will begin to um, have less saliva in my mouth. My blood vessels will constrict. My heart rate will begin pounding really hard. And, and so this body is turning on, and the reason why it turns off in certain areas is to conserve energy so that I can fight, flight, or freeze, okay? And so let's say the system turns on, a teen just got their boyfriend, girlfriend broke up with them, the system's turned on, their one coping skill is self-harm, and how are they gonna turn the system off? So we're talking about the system's on, they turn it on, or they turn it off. So as, so this is where your question comes in. So what do I do? Boyfriend just breaks up with my daughter, right? Or my um, girlfriend just breaks up with my son. She, he or she's running in the house, what do I do? Okay, when the system on, is on, I'm in the, I like to say in the rear of my brain. And so the, the now we already know, because I showed you, we showed you, is that the frontal lobe is, is lacking in development already. So my amygdala turns on, I'm a teen that has low functioning in the, mid, in the frontal lobe already, and then as a result of the amygdala turning on, my frontal lobe is turned off already. There's research to show it turns off to 0%, <laughs> okay? So we're in adults, too. So we're talking about a teen with very little brain power, and then all of a sudden they get hyper aroused in the system that they have no control over because it's just, it goes through the eyeballs, right, our sight, our vision, all of our senses turn on, and now we're here or they're there. So how do we get them to the frontal lobe? The frontal lobe is, is our planning direction. It's called the executive functioning. It's how I plan and make plans, right? The trick is getting your teen over to the parasympathetic nervous system. The two parts cannot act alone or act with each other. Okay, if my sympathetic nervous system's on, the parasympathetic is off. Okay, it works like an air conditioning unit: your body, my body, and their body. Okay, and so once it kicks on, it must turn on the system. Okay, it's looking for a. a, a so if I turn my system, on, my air conditioning on 75, it kicks on at you know 77. It's going to get it to homeostasis, right? And so that's how our bodies work with this, the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic. So let's say I have a teen. How do I get them? The trick is getting them over to the parasympathetic. The parasympathetic is attached to our frontal lobe, which is planning and it, um, planning, uh, functioning, all of that. The rear of the brain is connected to the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So the two don't act alone. Okay, so sympathetic is. Um, amygdala, high emotion, parasympathetic. Yeah. Parasympathetic is the um, calm reaction where my body's starting to turn back. Okay, so I'm gonna do an exercise. What color are your shoes? Don't look down. No, no, look down. Oh, look down. <laughs> Good. Um, what color are your pants? Okay. Um, what's the date today? 24. Um, What's your name? Kevin. What's your name? What day of the week is it? Tuesday. Good. Um, what time do you think it is? Yeah. About 7 to Okay. And what color are your shoes? Uh, black and red. Good. What color is your shirt? Green. Green. In order for you to answer those questions, you're in the frontal lobe. Okay? So one of the tricks to, to teens, get them in the frontal lobe. Okay, if they're really upset, they're in the back of the brain, they're in the rear of the brain. So what I like to say is, what time of day is it? Sit down, get them grounded, right? Where are your feet, right? Where are your feet? The frontal lobe has to answer. So the problem is, is parents try to question their kids when they're in the rear of the brain. They can't tell you. That's why they sit there and look at you. I don't know. Well, that's because they're all emotional in the back of the brain. The system is not turned on yet, so you have to start to turn the system on. Do you have that sense? This, the, okay, mm -hmm. so she's gonna go around. This is, so we want you to think of the five senses. So I'm gonna, I'm triggering your five senses. Okay, so I did sight, right? Now we're gonna do smell. So this one is any peppermint. Smells, I do okay. both do you want to smell? And so the smells help to focus us right. in. Peppermint? So okay. if I Can smell I put some peppermint here? or lavender are my two favorite, okay. and Oh, 
Can you hear me now? Well, uh, actually, oh, let me oh. Sorry. There's two conversations going on. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, give it to me. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Okay. We're going to be putting these right on our hand. We have peppermint, so you can spell it if you're comfortable with that. You can say no to. We'll just throw it on you. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> so, peppermint and lavender are my two favorite. I also like tree leaf, but um, most of my clients like lavender or peppermint. Um, there's one on Amazon that's called um, Grandma. That's my favorite. This is not that brand, and I'm like, oh, I got it for this presentation. The Grandma brand is the best. It's called Grandma's Incense, and they have like 20 different, 50 different um, types. Okay, keep this nearby. Go ahead, smell it, right? You can put it in the, like the scentsies that go, that um, steam out, okay? Scents, any type of, um, the five senses, right? Touch, taste, hear, sight, smell. Any of those will help them to get to the frontal lobe, but especially questions that they have to answer. What's your shoe? What, what, what color is your shoe? What, mom? What color is your shoe? What? They'll get used to it. They like it, right? It's called grounding. Where are your feet? Sit down, right? Get us grounded. Do it with them. Um, get on their level to um, physically, right? If they're sitting, you sit. If they're standing, you stand, unless you're really tall. Like, I'm really tall, so I'll sit regardless. But, um, but get on their level with them, whatever they're doing, right? If they're crying, eh, try not to, it's okay to cry to show emotion, but be that, um, it's okay to cry and show emotion, but again, getting them out of that too. It's okay to cry, right? We always say that it's okay to cry, but, um, getting them to a place where they can answer questions because they're still in that back of the brain, right? Okay, any questions on that? So that would be my, my answer is just ask them just where are you at, ground them. Tell them what you're gonna do first. Like go through this when they're not upset. <laughs> and you have a handout that I had given to you that it says dysregulated and regulated system and it breaks it down to different processes that are going on when you are regulated and when you're dysregulated. So the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So this helps you identify where your kid is at, if they're not talking, if they're good at hiding it. Kids that have felt bad for a really long time get really good at looking okay. So these are some of the things to look for or to straight up ask. Okay, I think that's, is that your slide? This is my slide. Okay. <laughs> so again, be supportive despite disagreeing. It's okay to disagree. And that's a big contention with communication is they don't listen to me, right? So an easy way for kids to feel like you're, you're listening to them, you can just say, I hear that you're saying blah, blah, blah. But what I'm thinking, Right? Or don't do the but. Even better, right? I understand that this is what you're saying. You don't have to say you agree or disagree. I understand. I hear you. And another big thing that works really well for families is asking your kid, can we talk? Or you can talk to me anytime. Tell me if you want me to respond or just listen. A lot of times, kids are like, whenever I start talking to her, she just starts telling me, well, just do this and do that, and I want you to, and we, we talked about this, and all right, I'm not talking to you anymore, right? So tell me if you want me to just listen, and sometimes it's hard, it's hard. You know, you wanna help your kids. We have a lot of fix-it parents, you know? You're not the fix-it people. You're, you're there to love and support. That's where therapy comes in, you know? And we don't fix either. But, you know, as parents, get them help, listen to them, support and love them. That's your role. A lot of parents don't feel like they're doing enough. That's your role. Mm -hmm. And it's a big role. <laughs> yes. Big role. Keep the boundaries, open communication. And the last slide is um, using motivation, not punishment. So I always say, Come at it from a, um, lift them up in love, not in punishment, don't put them down and punish. Um, it's not a punishing issue, right? P punishment is not, this is not a behavioral issue. Now again, keeping your house rules. If they break house rules, you keep it very clear. You broke a house rule. If they're self-harming, obviously, I always tell teens, if you self-harm or they're suicide, even adults, they, 
they get less space, right? They get more boundaries, right? They get their door taken off, which is what we suggest. Take their door off. Don't let them have a door. A door is a privilege. They don't need a door. Um, take the door off. And then guess what? That, that comes into play later on when they can earn it back. And what's really cool about a door is you, there's like a lot of ways to earn it back so you can really take your time. Well, you're going to earn a curtain first, then you're going to earn beads, then you're going to earn a half door, then you're going to earn a full door without a doorknob. So then you got like six months worth of, of, <laughs> of, you know, rather than just get the door right away. You know, go through these stages and use it as a opportunity to really gain that motivation for them to do well. Um, same with like the cell phone or any of that. If they're, if they're doing stuff that they're not supposed to be, you know, enact whatever your rules are at home. We don't want to tell you what your rules should be because you're all parents and we think you're, you're likely pretty good at it. So um, we don't want to tell you what your rules should be, but just stick to the rules so that they understand what they are too. And that's me and my dog. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.